John, thank you uh, so much. As you said, we're at uh, Morgan Stanley headquarters with uh, James Gorman. James, thanks uh, so much for having us. It's great to, to be with you, but particularly in person. Yeah, it's great to be back. We're just talking. I think the last time I did a live interview was with you right before COVID happened. On the E-Trade deal, February 2020. So we hope it's not a bad, uh, a bad omen. We're, we're going to get to both E-Trade uh, and to in the office versus out of the office sure. a, a, bit, a bit later if we can. But let's kick off with the markets because <clears throat> despite a bit of a sell-off today, we're, we're so close to record highs. Does the outlook you see over the next 12 months justify being at record highs? I think the record high is a surprise. I mean, by definition, if you have global economic growth, corporations are growing. Uh, unless they're doing something wrong with their cost basis, their profits are improving. And at the same P multiple, I, I, actually, by definition, every day market should close at a record high. I think what we're seeing, though, is within this market, there are some extraordinary moves in certain sectors and certain companies. And that's the real risk at this point. Is there a difference, though? I mean, clearly every year, every time markets have had a run, we question, oh, has it run too much? But is there a difference now versus at any point in the last decade because rates might be about to rise? Well, it's, it always surprises me how little the market prices in what is going to be the reality around rates. I mean, rates will rise with absolute certainty. And I think it will happen, as I'm sure we're going to talk about probably sooner than most people mm -hmm. do. I've felt that for a long time. Um, with that will come more pressure on the economy, more pressure on growth, more pressure on credit, and therefore more pressure on equities. That's a given. But that kind of readjustment back to a more normal environment, not necessarily a bad thing. A small correction here is not necessarily a bad thing. So, so some of the areas of the market you did think were, were more than just mm -hmm. facing a small correction. Which areas are we talking about? Crypto SPAC, that, that kind of part yeah, of Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at it, just where, where have there been the obvious excesses? Companies, you know, trading uh, new companies at uh, 30, 40, 50 times revenues. Uh, the SPAC uh, explosion, which appeared and then disappeared. Obviously, Bitcoin, whether it's worth 60,000 or 6,000, but the rate of change, uh, you know, what's going on with some of the so-called Reddit stocks uh, that have exploded. You're seeing these sort of moments of where you look at it rationally and you say, really, is that, does that make sense? But the aggregate market doesn't, is, is not crazy. The aggregate p picture is not crazy. Do you have any personal exposure to any of those areas, particularly as they pull back, like crypto, for example, or not? Oh, Wilf, I'm very, I'm very conservative. No, no I, never, I never invested in crypto. I was told to by a lot of people. I, I, I obviously miss that. No, I, I'm uh, obviously, given my job, I'm pretty conservative. Just, just a lot of Morgan Stanley stock, which I'm sure you won't say is, is overpriced like some of those areas. Let's it's move... outperformed some of those, actually. It, it has. It's, it's, been, it's been a very strong performer. Congratulations on that. Let, let's talk about um, the rates outlook, as you said. Um, <clears throat> last time we had you on, again, you, you've been a bit ahead of the curve in terms of saying that the Fed is going to have to play catch up. Do they still have to play catch up? I mean, expectations have come in a bit as to when they might first hike rates. Well, let's sort of set the table for a minute. Right now, we have, we have economic growth and we have synchronized growth, meaning in every region of the world is undergoing at some level of growth, which is atypical. Normally, one region is counterbalancing another. So we have global synchronized economic growth. We have record low interest rates pretty much in every country in the world. And we have record fiscal stimulus in most countries in the world. Ordinarily, you don't need fiscal stimulus if you've got strong growth. Ordinarily, you don't have low interest rates if you've got strong growth. So we are heading to a rising interest rate environment. I felt the Federal Reserve would be better off storing away some of the rate increases for when the inevitable turndown comes. You've got some ammunition to fight with. At the moment, at zero interest rates, we have no ammunition. We're 10 rate increases, 10 quarter point rate increases from normal. So if I were the Fed, I would start moving earlier rather than later, store away some ammunition and accept the reality. Now, this is before you even get to the inflation discussion. So we'll see. I guess the um, FOMC meeting is, I think, this Wednesday. Wednesday. Uh, we'll see where they come out. I would be very surprised if there aren't more dots talking about rate increases next year. And, and if that does materialise, and, and you're right on that front, could it derail the economy or, or you're still pretty confident that, that there's support for the economy overall. Yeah, I don't think it derails the economy. I think this is what you, you, need. you need. You need balance in the economy. If there's too much liquidity, too many, too many deals, too many transactions, too much growth happens under false pretenses because the money was too cheap. We need money to be normalized for st stable economic growth. I don't think the economy is going to be derailed. I think the market, may, the market may have a setback for a little bit, but that's fine. 
the Fed's job is not to worry about the market, it's to worry about the economy. Uh, lots of spots on the Fed to, to be filled. The White House mm. saying today that they'll try and make announcements for Christmas. Do, do you worry that that regulatory pendulum will, will come back and, and that banks will, will, will get uh, a, a lot more of the tightening regulation over the next five years? Well, there's, there's a, a bit of a myth that somehow we've um, gone through a massive deregulation. I mean, I, I was there right at the beginning when our company became a bank holding company, when the first GCFIs were announced, when the first C-card tests were put in place, and there was an increase in the level of regulation, level of capital the banks had to hold in this country dramatically from 2008-9 through to about 2016-17. There have been some modest changes. If it went from a scale of, I don't know, 40 to 100, we're probably back at, you know, 92, 90. Some modest adjustments to, for example, the way the Volcker rule mm -hmm. was being applied. Um, do I think the banks need more capital given where they are? Absolutely not. I mean, they're functioning very well. And if you reduce the bank's capital, you might hurt growth in the economy. So right now, I think, if, are there going to be some more adjustments? I'm sure there will be over time under any new administration. But a fundamental redo of what's been mm -hmm. done over a decade on a global basis through the Basel rules internationally and with the Fed, I would be absolutely surprised if that happens. Um, clearly, the outlook on the economy is still ultimately constructive. It's been a, a, another very strong year for Morgan Stanley. Can, can next year repeat that, particularly when we talk about trading and investment banking? Well, it's, you know, it's hard to know. We, we budgeted, uh, we didn't budget what we delivered this year. We've had now uh, through, I won't talk about this year for a minute, but uh, 2018, 19 and 20 were each consecutive records. And through the first nine months of this year, we're ahead of 2020 pace. So we're hitting for our fourth consecutive record. Um, you know, revenues of the company have gone from about 34 billion five or six years ago to 60 billion we're on track for this year. And, you know, net income of 12, 13, 14 billion. I mean, it's been, it's been an extraordinary run here. And it has definitely been enabled and helped by what's gone on in the broader economy. But it's also been driven by the business model choices that we've mm -hmm. made. So next year, I think the business model choices will sustain us very well. I think we'll have, a, we'll have a very good year next year. How the broader economy plays out, how the markets play out, the IPO markets, the M&A will be driven a little bit by that. So that is less clear, but I think, I think we'll have a great year next year. You, you mentioned the business model changes. We mentioned the, the interview we did here almost two years ago when you bought E-Trade. Eaton Vance followed soon after that. At the time, when you were on media interviews and analyst calls, you had to justify the price you were paying. And, and you said, you know, to get a good asset, you've got to pay uh, a full price. Since then, the price of asset management assets has only gone up further. So how are you thinking about those deals now? And, and would you add more or has the price of asset management uh, acquisitions gone too high now? You know, we spent between E-Trade and Eaton Vance, I think about 20, 21 billion. I think it was about uh, 13 and 7, 8, uh, something like that. Um, the market cap since we did those deals, since we closed, uh, the stock price has doubled and the market cap has gone up by about 100 billion. So there are a lot of people at the time who tell you that you should buy the company but pay a billion dollars less, which they did. I said, I agree. Unfortunately, that's a null set. The seller wanted the extra billion dollars. So you have a choice. You either pay the billion dollars, get the company. Don't pay the billion dollars, get nothing. We will now own this. E-Trade e uh, has been around for decades. Eaton Van's been around for 94 years. We're going to own it for the next 94 years. I don't care about plus or minus a billion dollars for a company or a $180 billion company. You've got to focus on what strategically makes sense. The people who worry about pricing and that level of precision, firstly, they wouldn't be able to tell me what we paid for it a year ago because nobody remembers. And secondly, you just don't get stuff done. Your job is to make the call when the moment arrives. We made the call. We're very pleased with it. A couple more calls might materialise in the same vein over the next year or two? I mean, you, you've, got to be, you've got to be open. We're, we're a growing global business, but we're not compulsively acquisitive. Um, we doubled our dividend this year. We raised our buyback, so we're using our capital for that, for our shareholders, but also support the business. But if sensible deals come along, of course, we'll be taking a look at them. But we're not out there, we must do a deal kind of attitude. Do you expect, with E-Trade in mind, retail investor participation to fall? Has it already slipped? And, and does that hurt Morgan Stanley's results overall, if and when that happens? It doesn't. I mean, it's the, the retail activity within E-Trade is not a major economic driver for this firm. Uh, what E-Trade is an economic driver for uh, is a lot of the options type business that gets done there, the workplace business, 
the digital bank, uh, the deposits. Now, combined with our business, we've got about 330, 340 billion of deposits. So transactional activity will come off from the peaks. Right now, it's held up. I mean, I'm a little astonished, but it will come off from the peaks at some point. That's fine. I, you know, we, you make no money on the transactions mm -hmm. anyway. So that's not the economic driver. I want to talk about operating in, in China. Do, do you do business in China proudly or do you do it begrudgingly? Definitely not begrudgingly. I mean, we're, we're proud of our business. We're a global company. We've got to support global corporations. I've dealt with Chinese state-owned enterprises and corporations for decades now. And we've got, we've got hundreds of employees there. We've taken full control of our joint venture, which was called Washing Securities, and of our asset management venture. And listen, fundamentally, we'll, we, we don't try and front-run U.S. policy. We're a U.S. headquartered, U.S. regulated company. We follow U.S. policy. I, I, I totally get that. Um, I, I do wonder if the temperatures changed recently. The White House 10 days ago saying it's not sending government officials to the Olympics and, and said that was due to, quote, the PRC's ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity. I mean, genocide confirmed yeah. by the White House. Yeah. Does that not make you rethink whether you even want to be making money there? That's, it's, I mean, that's strong language, obviously, genocide. But again, we're guided by U.S. policy. I'm not going to try and get in front of U.S. policy and determine which countries we do or do not bis do business in if the U.S. is saying they want us to do business. Last time I checked, the biggest trading partners in the world are U.S. and China with each other. Mm -hmm. So it would, seem, it would seem like there's a lot of business being done at the government level between the countries. So, no, we'll stand by policy. We continue to run our business in China as we always have. Uh, in terms of here and, well, all around the world and, and back in the office, have you seen everyone that you wanted to come back to the office come back to the office? I mean, it varies so much around the world. I mean, if, if you look in India, I think 5% of our 10,000, 12,000 employees are back in the office in New York City, the building we're in today. Uh, we're running, I think, about 65 per cent. We're 95 per cent vaccinated. On any given day, about 65 of that 95 are in the office. You can't come in unless you're not vaccinated. We set that up some time ago. Listen, we're, we're in a transition period still. Um, I was wrong on this. I thought we would have been out of it by Labor Day, past Labor Day. We're not. And I think we'll still be in it through most of next year. Everybody's still finding their way. And then you get the Omicron uh, variant, you know, who knows, we'll have uh, 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 pi, we'll have uh, theta, we'll have <laughs> epsilon. You know, we'll eventually run out of letters in the Greek alphabet, God willing. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's continuing to be an issue. I just pray and hope everybody gets vaccinated and everybody gets a booster shot. That's our defence. So you, you made some strong comments in the summer about wanting to get people back to the office. One of them even implied that people wouldn't get paid as much if they were not here in the office in New York. They wouldn't get New York salaries given, as you, you said, that we're probably going to be in this for another 18 months. Is that, that view on hold for those 18 months? Well, we have, what I said was, if you think you can move and choose to where you want to live and everybody moves to, I don't know, some, some other part, low-cost part of the country and just chooses when their teams are working in New York, that's going to create issues. Mm -hmm. But our employees haven't reacted that way. I mean, fundamentally, they've tried to do the right thing. And as I say, on any day, 65 of 95% are sitting in this building in New York. You go down the trading floors... Uh, two, three, four, and five, you'd find, you'd find hundreds of people doing their job on those trading floors. So that hasn't been an issue. Uh, in terms of the capital, uh, lots of excess capital. Is the preference shifting between buybacks, dividends? You, you're favouring the dividend now a little bit more? Well, we doubled the dividend, uh, and that's big. So we're now paying on an annual basis $2.80 a share. By the way, we're buying back about $100 million stock, 100 million shares a year. So the actual dividend cost comes down because mm -hmm. fewer shares outstanding. But think of the $2.80 post-crisis, that number was $0.20, cents, $0.05 cents a quarter. So we've gone from $0.20 cents in 10 years to $2.80. We doubled in the last year. Um, you know, I'm, I, obviously, we'll, we'll look with the board at the dividend every year. But as we continue to grow the business, I would expect we'd see dividend growth. In the meantime, we've got excess capital. We buy back stock when it makes sense. Uh, we've been doing that for the last year and we'll continue doing that. But then you look at investing in the business, investing in our people. And if there are sensible deals to be done, we'll do it. So you're toggling between all four. But I've said for a long time, I wanted this company to reflect the yield stock type capability that the wealth and asset management businesses bring. And as a result, with the dividend we're paying out, we're paying out a bit over five billion in dividend now. Mm -hmm. That also is a show of real confidence in our business model. 
I wanted to finish, James, if I may, just uh, touching on, on your, your leadership planning. You updated us on that uh, earlier in the year and at the time said uh, you thought three to five more years y yourself. I'm not going to try and get you to answer specifically the number of years because I know you won't. But has, has it shifted in your mind as to what the factor will be uh, on that timeline? I is it no longer a question of Morgan Stanley absolutely needs me day to day and, and more a question of when I know who the next person is and they're ready, th then it'll be time to hand over the reins? Well, su succession is, is one of the hardest things you do as a CEO and as a board, and obviously it's the board's decision ultimately. Um, there are a number of things that go into it. One is the stability and, and evidence the strategy is working. I think we've got that. Second is one's own interest in the job. I love doing the job. Mm -hmm. uh, but thirdly, what's the right thing for the organisation to carry it forward for the next 10 and 20 years? If you look at some of the people we put on the operating committee this year, I think we put four... Don't think, I know we put four people on since the beginning of the year, all uh, under the age of 45. That's setting up this company for the next 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, we've got terrific executives who have been named who could replace me. And, you know, we, we, need to get, we need to get a few of those ready for the board. That'll take a couple of years. But I, I, I believe in succession. I believe in planning. Um, I'm very proud of the team we've got. We've got some fantastic executives. And I'm confident the place will thrive under them. James, it's always a pleasure to catch up. Thank you very much, and great to do it in person as well for, Thank you. for once. Yeah, thanks for coming over, Will. James Gorman, the chairman and CEO of Morgan Stanley. Guys, I'll send it back to you.